Welcome to the Messenger Family Research Room at the uh, Scottsdale Heritage Connection Center inside Civic Center Library. I'm community historian Joan Fadala, and I'm pleased to share with you one of my favorite topics of, uh, and areas of Scottsdale history, and that's the evolution of our resorts and tourism industry. I'm sure many of you, like me, came here first as a visitor, loved what you saw, everything Scottsdale, and then eventually relocated. But aren't we lucky to be living in a place that millions of people from around the world have planned their vacations or meetings or conventions uh, around, but then have to go home after a few days or a few weeks and we get to live here? So I want to mention that I'm recording this uh, presentation on September 24th, 2020, a time uh, it, every year uh, when the local resorts and tourism industry are really gearing up for the high season. And although they, they are certainly doing that again this year, this year they have the added challenge of the COVID-19 pandemic and all of its impacts on travel. So I'd like to dedicate this particular presentation on the history and evolution of our resort and tourism industry to all of those hoteliers, resort um, operators, all of their employees, all of the guests um, that have adapted to uh, changes in the environment, and also experience Scottsdale, the quintessential promoter of everything good in Scottsdale and giving us all reasons to travel here. And uh, I also um, hope that uh, with this coming season, uh, we'll have lots of company and uh, our resorts will thrive just as they have for the last over 100 years. So perhaps you know that our Scottsdale resorts have evolved quite drastically over the last century. They started out as very rustic health camps and guest ranches uh, and without electricity and running water to today's luxury resorts and spas. But you know, some things have never changed about the resorts and that's what Scottsdale itself has to offer by a location with climate, with landscape, with all the cultural diversity that we have here in the blend of cultures, with a mix of activities and amenities, and of course, perhaps best of all, the friendly welcoming nature that we as residents offer to those tourists that are coming to Scottsdale and its resorts. Well, founded as a farming community in 1888 by Chaplain Winfield Scott and his wife Helen, uh, they were some of the first to welcome guests onto their property, uh, welcoming people from back east in the Midwest that were friends of friends and offering them uh, a very rustic tent home to stay on their property while they either considered relocating here or perhaps came here for health reasons. But the first actual hoteliers, if you will, or innkeepers that pay, uh, accepted paying guests were Howard and Ida Underhill, who opened Oasis Villa on the northwest corner of Scottsdale and Indian School Road. Of course, the, those weren't paved and named roads at the time, but that's the general location. I, again, very rustic accommodations. They were tent homes with wood frames and tent flaps that would open to allow a breeze in. And again, remember, these places were only open to guests uh, from about November 1st until May 1st. This was decades before we had the air con uh, the benefit of air conditioning. And so it was mainly people that came for a season and most of them were health seekers. After a few years of operating Oasis Villa, uh, the Underhills sold the property to Ed and Mary Graves, who had recently located to the tiny farming settlement of Scottsdale in, uh, in the early 1900s from Kentucky. Uh, they renamed Oasis Villa into Graves Guest Ranch, which was a combination guest ranch and health camp. Now as an aside, I'm not sure if I had very poor health that I would want 
to come and stay at a place named Graves Guest Ranch. But nonetheless, they did come. Uh, they, uh, many people came for the season, again, as health seekers. And there were no doctors or nurses on site. Uh, in fact, there wasn't even a hospital anywhere close to Scottsdale. But their doctors back east thought that people would benefit from the warm, dry climate in the winter. And also, because we were a farming community, they had the benefit of, of locally grown citrus fruits, the fruits and vegetables that were fresh off the tree or from the ground, fresh dairy and poultry products, which again, back east and up uh, in the Midwest, was really hard to come by during the winter months. They also benefited from a, a gentle exercise. They went on horseback rides. And uh, one of the popular on-site locations at Graves Guest Ranch was a gentle but very dressed up game of croquet. And uh, again, they were all seasonal residents. And the other thing that Ed Graves started at Graves Guest Ranch, which continues today, was he opened a curio shop, the precursor of today's very well-equipped and appointed resort gift shops. And Ed sold locally produced arts and crafts, particularly Native American baskets and pottery, which were very popular with visitors because this was still very exotic to them. Um, and Arizona, when the Graves Guest Ranch first opened, was still, of course, a territory and very, uh, very new to those people that were traveling. So moving on to how we started getting into the luxury um, resort business, uh, canal builder W.J. Murphy that had built the Arizona Canal and his son Ralph opened our first luxury resort, the Ingleside Inn, in about 1910. It was located basically between what's now Thomas and Indian School Roads and the canal, so between 64th and uh, 58th Street. Uh, the Ingleside Inn had another very important amenity that launched another industry for Scottsdale. It had the area's first golf course. Uh, it was a nine-hole, very rugged uh, outlay. It had all dirt fairways and sand greens, but it attracted uh, golfers, including, for a while, um, the Vice President of the United States, Thomas Marshall, uh, before he and his wife actually built a winter home in Scottsdale. The Ingleside Inn, again, uh, attracted people that came for a season. They would come by train into Union Station at, uh, in downtown Phoenix, and then they would come by horse and buggy or an early motorized stage uh, out to the Ingleside Inn. It wasn't a health camp, but it was still healthy living because it was situated in the middle of citrus groves um, in Ingleside, which we now know as, Ar uh, know as Arcadia. Uh, they also um, provided their guests um, gentle outings, kind of interesting outings, where they actually took tables, white uh, linen tablecloths and china and crystal up to uh, Echo Canyon in Camelback uh, Mountain and uh, catered a dinner from the inn up there for their guests and then had local Native Americans uh, perform dances and, and musical performances. Uh, for the guests as a cultural opportunity. Uh, Ingleside was also well promoted. It was featured on the cover of an early Arizona magazine called Arizona the State Magazine. And it, it often ran full page ads in the Arizona Republican newspaper, uh, which I draw attention to two things. It not only promoted staying at the inn, but also promoted buying land around the inn uh, as an investment or as a place where families could move from back east and settle in the Ingleside district. The other thing that's interesting in this ad and the ad of many of the pre-war uh, inns and guest ranches is that they always mentioned who the owner, proprietor, or host was because this really gave a personal touch to the inns and gave an implied promise that they were going to be welcomed in a very personal way by the host and hostess, usually a husband and wife, 
um, and uh, were, would be well looked after and taken care of when they visited Scottsdale. And now you're probably wondering what happened to Ingleside. It continued to operate until the late 1930s, and then in 1945 the property was taken over by a private girls school called the Brownmore School for Girls, which operated there until 1958 when the buildings were uh, sold and raised, and now uh, the golf course is uh, lays beneath what is the Arizona Country Club golf course, and there are condos and apartments where the actual inn stood. You know, interest in traveling to the West was really stoked in the 20s and 1930s by uh, such writers as Zane Gray, who painted such a, a literary picture of adventurous uh, travel into the West, and by artists like Thomas Moran and others who painted beautiful oil paintings of the West. And of course, the Santa Fe Railroad often created posters and brochures that really romanticized traveling to the West. So it's not a surprise then that more inns uh, developed in the Scottsdale area. For example, the Jokaki Inn was started uh, first as a tea room in 1926 by Sylvia Evans and Lucy Cuthbert, and it, by popular demand two years later then turned into an actual inn with overnight accommodations. Not only did Lucy and Sylvia offer wonderful, delicious cuisine and southwestern dishes, but they also uh, decorated Jokaki Inn with arts and crafts uh, indigenous to the area from, that reflected our Hispanic culture, our Native American culture, and things that you could only find in the, in the West, like chili ristras hanging um, on a wall or uh, different sconces that would have were inspired by um, architecture um, in the Southwest. And a lot of this was influenced by the fact that Sylvia Evans' uh, mother-in-law, who lived next door, uh, Sylvia, or excuse me, uh, Jessie Benton Evans, uh, she and other artists uh, had oil paintings throughout the uh, property. Uh, Jessie Benton Evans, because she was uh, part and parcel of the local cultural community, uh, befriended Frank Lloyd Wright, who was an early guest at the uh, Joe Cocky Inn. In fact, he and his wife stayed there until they could, b they and their apprentices built Taliesin West. And Frank Lloyd Wright often returned to Joe Cocky Inn to have lunches or to be a luncheon speaker, uh, along with his friend Jessie Benton Evans. And by the way, the main building of Jokaki Inn still stands on the grounds of the Venetian, although it's not used for overnight accommodations. Closer to here, right at the Civic Center Library, was what was the Adobe House. It had originally been built as a family home in the late 1890s, but in 1926, Mildred Bartholo, and I hope you're seeing a trend here that many of the early inns and resorts were either owned or co-owned by women, uh, Mildred Bartholo opened a guest ranch called the Adobe House, and it's approximately where the parking garage is between the Civic Center Library and the uh, Scottsdale Stadium. Uh, this, because it opened in the late 1920s, uh, added a few uh, essentials and it boasted in its ads that it uh, had steam heat, electricity, and private baths for all of its guests, as well as, of course, the cuisine that other inns were using of uh, fresh fruits and vegetables that were locally grown. Other uh, pre-World War II facilities that certainly uh, added to the ambiance of our resort community and put us on the map as a, as a treasured uh, resort community were places like the Camelback Inn, opened in 1936 by Jack Stewart, a longtime local hotelier, and the financier John C. Lincoln. It was, a, again, a seasonal resort, uh, had lots of social activities for all ages, uh, it had a renowned stable where the stable hands actually put on rodeos and gymkhanas for its uh, guests. And uh, it also attracted celebrity guests from Hollywood and other places. Clark Gable stayed there. John F. Kennedy, during the time that he was uh, serving in World War II, did part of his R&R &R or recuperation at the Camelback Inn. And the uh, retailer, J.C. Penney, was a frequent guest uh, and always 
always took the opportunity while he was staying there to visit his local stores in the Phoenix Scottsdale area. Another uh, resort that was on Scottsdale Road and about Jackrabbit on the uh, west side of Scottsdale Road was Kiami Lodge. Uh, it was a small guest ranch, um, opened in 1937, and they, like other resorts, were hiring local uh, up-and-coming or established artists. And the Kiami Lodge had picked a student who, uh, at the Phoenix Indian School by the name of Charles Lolama to paint uh, brochures on its walls in the dining room and other public areas. Unfortunately, those uh, were destroyed when the resort was torn down in the 70s. Uh, but Charles Loloma, of course, fame lived on and became quite a prominent jeweler um, and artist in Scottsdale's post-war art community. Others were the Casa Hermosa, now the Hermosa Inn. Lottie Seidel opened a few cottages right on Main Street in downtown Scottsdale in the 1930s. And the Livingstons opened a trailer camp for tourists at the corner of Pinnacle Peak and Scottsdale Road, exactly where the Appaloosa Library is today. So we had all kinds of accommodations available. And one of the last uh, that were uh, pre and during World War II to open and then became very popular after World War II was the Paradise Inn, which opened uh, just east of the Jokaki Inn and was operated by Robert Evans, the ex-husband of Sylvia Evans, who opened the Jokaki Inn. And uh, both inns shared a golf course, the Valley Golf Course, which was also a popular amenity at a, a, the growing number of resorts in Scottsdale. Got to have golf and tennis and all those other amenities for the guests. Now one thing I have to interject here, and it's not a happy part of our history, is that pre-1960s and the Civil Rights Movement, a number of the resorts in Scottsdale, in Phoenix, and throughout the country were what they called restricted, and only allowed a certain type of clientele to stay at the resorts. And again, I would be remiss if I didn't mention this, this rather unhappy part of our history. It kind of makes me have goosebumps to think that something like that happened in our area or anywhere in the United States. Uh, but fortunately, with the civil rights movement and our growing awareness that accommodations here and everywhere need to be equal opportunity accommodations, those restrictions, thank goodness, went by the wayside. But it is a part of history. Now, of course, World War II impacted travel with gas rationing and people in military service. But the resorts during World War II hosted bond drives and welcomed military members for R&R, rest and relaxation. But then after the war, the resort industry really started to take off and is closer to what we know today as our resort industry. You know, during the war, to escape the, the horrors of wartime, many people spent their t leisure time in the movies and they were watching westerns. And so by the end of the war, there was really a demand to visit the West. And uh, Scottsdale, uh, thanks to uh, some of the existing and new guest ranches and inns that were popping up were welcoming the new people that were traveling here. Uh, another thing that had happened during World War II that was a really happy occurrence for our resort industry was the advent of air conditioning, which allowed a much more comfortable stay, extended the season, and uh, laid the groundwork for us being a year-round destination. And the other thing that really burgeoned after World War II is that people weren't necessarily coming for a whole season by train. They were flying in and renting cars, or they were driving here, and so the resort not, were not the place where people spent a majority of their time. They slept there and they may have had some of their meals there, but they wanted things to do off property. So most of the resorts had to gear up for this car travel. 
The Casablanca Inn was one of the first to open after World War II. Again, it was a converted house that had been converted during the war to a corporate retreat of the Borg uh, Industries back in the Midwest. It had its own airstrip, and for many years uh, after it became an inn, Royal Treadway was the manager. And it was very distinctive in its design because it had a Moroccan-inspired uh, white dome. Another one that opened that was very popular was the Ryden Rock Ranch, which opened in 1949 by Dorothy and Burke Patterson. It was on Indian Bend Road, just east of what we now know is the McCormick Stolman Railroad Park. And Dorothy and Burke hosted an annual cook-off that kind of signaled the beginning of the tourist season and both local residents, seasonal residents, and those early tourists that came here about November time frame all came to that uh, cookout at Ryden Rock Ranch. And I might mention this was another place that was favored by certain celebrities. In fact, who remembers Fred McMurray from uh, Disney movies and My Three Sons? He was an often uh, repeat guest at the Ryden Rock Ranch. Now, Scottsdale also got a boost from a wonderful slogan that was created right after World War II. Entrepreneur and businessman Malcolm White, who became our first mayor after incorporation, coined the phrase the westmost western town to, re uh, to describe Scottsdale. And that was used as our tourist slogan from 1947 onward after the Chamber of Commerce was formed and uh, adopted that slogan as the tourist slogan. Another important thing in 1951 was that the town finally incorporated, and this was important because as more tourists were coming here, we needed paved streets, we needed street signs, and we needed a sewer system, we needed fire and police protection. So that was another very important boost to tourism as was the opening of the Arizona Craftsman Center in 1946 right on Main Street which gave us an arts and crafts uh, aura in Scottsdale and certainly was a great uh, tourist attraction. Well, I, I hope that you can see on the screen now a really interesting map produced by the Chamber of Commerce in the 1950s that shows how many guest ranches and inns opened in Scottsdale along uh, Camelback Road, up Scottsdale Road, and these ranged anywhere from accommodating 20 to 50 guests, again owned by usually a, a husband and wife, and uh, all identified with the innkeeper himself or herself and this again uh, was the mainstay in the late 1940s and early 1950s. Two that I want to mention particularly are kind of fun. Rancho Vista Bonita opened in 1950 at the uh, corner of Pinnacle Peak and Pima Road and in the 1950s the ad touted the fact that for $15 a day, that's $15 a day, you got a cottage, you got three three meals a day and access to a horse. Such a deal, right? And I might mention that we have uh, the Rancho Vista Bonita to thank for attracting one of our mainstay families to Scottsdale. It was a favorite of the Jackson family that came to visit from Michigan, and that's the same Jackson family of the Barrett Jackson Auto Auction now. Uh, so thank you Rancho Vista Bonita for attracting that family to Scottsdale. Another one that was another mainstay in the 1950s was the Paradise Valley Guest Ranch that was founded by Ray and Lee Silverman in 1953 and it was operated as a family-run business until just a few years ago when they sold uh, but it uh, was popular enough that it expanded and became a Granada Royale and then an Embassy Suites, a Chaparral Suites and was the host for so many civic activities in Scottsdale and the Silvermans were a great family, have always been a great family of not only hoteliers but civic uh, activists here in Scottsdale. And uh, last but not least, one of the 50s uh, inns that I wanted to mention was Sundown Ranch, which opened on what we now know as Hayden between Cactus and Shea. Uh, it later was renamed Scottsdale Country Club and also included Scottsdale's first championship golf course, the Sundown Ranch Golf Course that opened in 1953. 
So finally, because of air conditioning, we got our first two year-round resort hotels, the Safari and the Valley Ho, both opened in 1956. Uh, the Safari, uh, unfortunately gone, uh, torn down in the mid-1990s, was at the corner of uh, Scottsdale and Camelback Road. It also featured Paul Shank's French Quarter nightclub that had big band sounds and a lot of nightclub acts. Uh, and uh, was date night for many people in Scottsdale. It also featured fashion shows around its poolside. And it was, as the Valley Ho was, was one of the first places to really be designed to have cars uh, on its property with parking lots and drive up uh, facilities where cars could park outside of the, uh, of the rooms. The Hotel Valley Ho also opened in 1956 as the second of the two uh, year-round resorts and they really had a windfall after opening because Motorola opened on McDowell Road in, the, in 1957 just a few short months after the Valley Ho opened and the relocating engineers and uh, and their employees and other workers at Motorola that were relocating from Illinois to work uh, here in Scottsdale needed a place to stay while they hunted for homes or waited until a home was built. So this really helped tide over the first couple of summers that both uh, the Hotel Valley Ho and uh, the Safari opened. Again, many celebrities uh, came to the Valley Ho. In fact, Robert Wagner and Natalie Wood spent their honeymoon here after getting married at the Valley Ho after getting married in Scottsdale and uh, Janet Lee and her husband Tony Curtis stayed there while Janet Lee was filming a psycho in downtown Scott uh, downtown Phoenix and as an addition to celebrities as a draw, there was also a social director, which I guess now we would consider a concierge on property, who helped the guests find places that they could go, places to eat off property, and things to do during their vacations. They also, both the Valley Ho and the Safari, accommodated the first spring training teams, the, ba the uh, Baltimore Orioles and the Boston Red Sox when they came to town, as well as the players, media, and fans coming for the Phoenix Open when it was played in the 50s and 60s at the Arizona Country Club. The safari regrettably is gone, but the Hotel Valley Ho thrives today and is kind of a modern retro uh, vibe right in downtown Scottsdale. Our first spa opened in 1946. Now it seems like every resort has a spa, but Elizabeth Arden, the famous uh, cosmetics uh, tycoon, um, opened uh, the Main Chance Spa at the base of Camelback Mountain in 1946. It was for women only, attracted again many celebrities. Uh, uh, first Lady Mamie Eisenhower was a frequent guest. Uh, oftentimes she would come and stay at Main Chance while her husband, the President Ike, would play golf at the Paradise Valley Country Club. Actresses Ava Gardner and Rosalind Russell came there, as well as former ambassador Claire Booth Luce. They offered uh, the ladies that were staying there a 900 calorie a day spa cuisine uh, so that they could shed a few pounds, uh, gentle exercise, and many different types of skin treatments. Uh, and it uh, was a thriving uh, concern through the early 1990s when it closed and is now uh, part of their, the site of the main chance is still part of the Phoenician uh, property. Now in the 70s and 80s, as resorts continued to get larger and adding more amenities and more things for their guests to do following local and national trends, a couple of things I'll mention is that some of the newer resorts in the 1970s and 80s became part of our master plan communities in Scottsdale. So when McCormick Ranch became our first master plan community, the inn at McCormick Ranch and the Scottsdale Conference Resort opened and then the following decade in the 80s, the Hyatt at Ganey Ranch became part of Ganey Ranch's master plan community. And that gave uh, the guests access to the golf courses and other amenities in our master plan communities. 
And many resorts in the 70s, 80s, and continuing today were built to promote sports. A great example is John Gardner's Tennis Ranch that uh, was a follow-on to the Paradise Valley Racquet Club on McDonald in uh, Paradise Valley. Now it's called the Sanctuary. But during the 80s 90, and 90s, it was a haven for tennis players and also hosted the annual U.S. Congressional Tennis Tournament. And of course, when the Scottsdale Princess Resort opened in 1987 adjacent to the Tournament Players Club golf course uh, in, uh, that began hosting the Phoenix Open in 1987, it attracted not only people and players coming to the Phoenix Open, but also uh, the Princess uh, during the 80s, 90s, and early 2000s had a tennis stadium where world uh, tennis championships were played uh, during that time. And now one of the, the most recent trends that we've seen since the late 1990s is the addition of Indian gaming in our area and resorts being built on uh, nearby uh, Native American communities. Uh, Talking Stick Resort opened on the Salt River Pima Maricopa Indian community in the uh, 2000s, and it was followed just in 19, uh, or excuse me, in 2019 by Great Wolf Lodge. But a lot of different amenities offered there, and a whole en group of entertainment uh, things that had not been available to Scottsdale Resort guests, no matter where they were staying at Scottsdale. Aquariums, butterfly wonderlands, and a spring training stadium uh, all within walking distance of the resorts. Now in today's world in the 2000s there's been renewed interest. Uh, I, some could say we've come full circle to having resorts and hotels in downtown Scottsdale just like Oasis Villa and the Graves Guest Ranch over a century ago. The W Hotel and the now to be opened this fall Canopy Hotel across the street from the Scottsdale Museum of the West as well as several more hotels in the works for downtown Scottsdale really bring our entire resort history full circle concentrating not only in Old Town Scottsdale but through the breadth and depth of all 185 square miles of Scottsdale. In fact our entire area is a resort, resort community. And so much of bringing our tourists and hotel guests, meeting and convention people to Scottsdale, we owe a huge thanks to what is now Experience Scottsdale, but had been the Convention and Visitors Bureau and the Chamber of Commerce for all the innovative pr uh, promotions that they've done over the years to uh, let people throughout the country and the world know about all of the wonderful things that we have to offer in Scottsdale. And again, other things that have come full circle, medical tourism is popular now, that's what they call it, but it used to be the health camps that people came to. Now they come for the benefits of Scottsdale's Cure Corridor to uh, have treatment at Mayo Clinic, Honor Health, and other places here, but also combine it with a vacation. Also, ecotourism is popular. People, just they, as they did a century ago, have extended adventures out in the desert and enjoy our environment and landscape. And staycations have also become popular where locals enjoy coming uh, and using our local resorts and appreciating the fact that they live in a resort community. So just remember, you're always in good company in Scottsdale, uh, surrounded by tourists of all kinds, from celebrities and sports stars to future residents, and also those coming to attend our signature events. And most importantly, aren't we lucky to have the economic impact from our resort industry through sales and bed tax collections that fu help fund things in Scottsdale, as well as the jobs that our hotels and resorts uh, have created, and also the halo effect of all of the business generated by tourists tourists at our resorts, at our restaurants, and also our retail shops and other places.
So if you want to know more about our uh, Scottsdale tourism, tourism and resort area, you can come here to the Scottsdale Heritage Connection. You can find interesting books like this particular one about the history of the Camelback Inn called We Met at Camelback. Or you can go online and look at the digital collection of, of the Scottsdale Public Library and Scottsdale Historical Society that has so many interesting photos and oral histories that document our tourism and resort history. So once again, I salute our hoteliers and I hope they have a wonderful season this year and every other year.